Welcome to the Grant Writing Simplified Podcast. This is the place to learn how to make a big impact in your community through grant writing and nonprofit consulting. The world needs you to step forward as a grant writer and use your skills to lead with confidence. I'm Teresa Huff, former special ed teacher turned grant writer and nonprofit strategist. In my 20 years of freelancing, I've helped nonprofits triple their funding and exponentially increase their reach. Now I'm stepping up to mentor freelancers and nonprofit leaders like you who are ready to take your skills to the next level. It's time to get intentional about your vision so you can create lasting change in your community. Learn the skills and strategies you need to become the grant writer the world needs. Let's do this. Hey friends, welcome back. Great to have you. And if you're new around here, welcome. We have a lot of fun, a lot of great hosts like the one we're about to have today. Before we get started, I want to remind you that my TEDx talk is live. You can watch that on YouTube. You can search for Teresa Huff TEDx and it'll pop up. Go give it a listen, share it with your nonprofit friends so that we can all do a much better job of supporting our nonprofits in the long term to help them be more sustainable and competitive with grants and also just healthier all around as an organization. Last winter, I presented a grant writing workshop at a conference in Milwaukee, and it was so much fun just the hearing all the different missions and the work that people were doing. I mean, there were people from Alaska and all over the United States. It was really interesting. One of the hosts of this conference was the Nonprofit Alliance. Now, you may remember that name because I had invited Shannon McCracken back on the show in episode 70 and she is the CEO of the Nonprofit Alliance. So other than Shannon and briefly visiting with her on our podcast interview, I didn't know another soul going into this conference, and there were about 400 people there. However, you would have been really proud of this introvert soul because I had a great time, and I met a lot of new people. And there were some incredibly talented and passionate people who truly care about their nonprofit work that they're doing. And one of those people happened to sit down next to me at lunch. We got to visiting, and after hearing his story and his passion for leadership and building strong teams and his unique take on how he teaches it, I knew that my friend was a great person for you to meet too. Today, I am talking with Tim Ditloff. He is an avid sailor. He loves sailboats and sails on Lake Michigan a lot, and he incorporates this into leadership, which is a really unique spin and really fascinating. He uses a lot of fun and in-depth analogies, and he relates sailing to strong leadership. He even has events and takes people, takes teams of people on leadership sailing adventures to help develop their team building exercises. So I recommend following Tim on LinkedIn for a lot of thoughtful and inspirational posts on life and leadership and, of course, sailing. Tim has received world-class training in business, speaking, and sailing, so he knows his stuff, and he puts all of his knowledge to good use, and he helps companies and nonprofits with leadership development. His coaching and seminars help teams transform both personally and professionally. He has a Master of Science in Education, like me, and Tim is also a certified Franklin Covey trainer, a licensed U.S. Coast Guard captain, a certified John Maxwell facilitator, and a certified ASA sailing instructor. So I hope you enjoy because this is a really interesting spin and he has some great stories that really drive home his points in a unique way. So here we go. Tim, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Tell us a random fact about yourself. Well, I have um, was intrigued by the whole swashbuckling, um, you know, side of, uh, of history. And so back in college, I, I was actually on a fencing club and I learned how to fence. And, and uh, so when the Olympics come on, I'm a big fan of watching fencing. Nice. That's not a sport you hear about every day. No, no, it's kind of random, but yeah, I like history and 
and uh, the physical activity behind fencing. So it was fun. Nice. I see a theme here. You seem to like kind of the unusual type sport activities, fencing and now sailing. is. I was telling someone the other day that if something seems like impossible or doesn't make sense to do it, let's give it a try. So uh, <laughs> life, life didn't make sense. So let's try and figure out how to get this microscopic weight of a fly out onto the water and making a boat go without power. Um, that didn't make sense either. So let's, let's try and learn how to do that. And I've <laughs> uh, been sailing 20 some odd years. So, wow. yeah. So it's nice. Mm -hmm. Now you have used your sailing to really transform into some unusual leadership type space and topics. Tell us how that connection between the two came about. Yeah. I really view sailing as a, as a ministry. Um, I learned how to sail after I completed a master's in education. I've always been a student of uh, human learning and development. And when I learned how to sail, um, I saw the connections between just growing as an individual and, and um, personal development. And then as I started to race after I got into sailing and saw the dynamics in teams, I thought, wow, this whole dynamic can really help uh, both for-profit and nonprofit organizations as they work in teams to accomplish the mission that they set out for. Yeah, and that's an unusual way to approach it. And I feel like by doing that, it sort of neutralizes when sometimes there might be difficult dynamics or tension among teams. You can put it in this more neutral territory, get everybody on board, so to speak, <laughs> no pun intended, but bring them together in a way that you wouldn't be able to if you just entered their boardroom. Yeah, it's it's kind of um, diffusing, so to speak. Um, it gets people sometimes to a point where they're slightly uncomfortable, but overcoming and getting out of that comfort zone, I think can create great epiphanies um, for a ministry organization or again, a corporate leadership team um, where they have a whole appreciation of, of each other as, as individuals and for the greater mission of the, of the ministry and, and the organization. Right. And I feel like there's something about being outdoors in a different setting too. just being outside, being in nature, working with your hands in a completely different environment that is just, it's really good for the soul. <laughs> there's something about it. Yeah. Again, again, it's, it's that, Yeah, you know, when, when you're in a conference room with each other or you know, in a in a boardroom, yeah, it's it's pretty much um easy to be engaged on your phone or something else, but being outside seeing the city, for example, from the waterfront gives you a whole new perspective on some things. Mm -hmm. So walk us through what this looks like, what an exercise might be like when you're working with a nonprofit or a ministry. Yeah, basically, um, we want to take them through uh, a whole process where we want to help them really discover what their mission is as an organization. And then we want to help them really determine what that priority step might look like in achieving this grander vision, then helping them really develop a pathway to get there and then deliver an end, end product for them, whether that's a strategic plan or a capital campaign or even a building project um, through uh, Catalyst um, Construction, one of, uh, one of our partner companies. 
That's interesting that you start with the mission because that's similar to the process that I do with nonprofits when we're working on their grant readiness and grant strategy, but it always starts with their mission and vision. That's at the core of everything. And if that's unclear, the other parts are not going to come together well in whatever direction, whether it's like you said, the leadership, the fundraising or the grant planning, whatever it is, it really comes back to getting that mission clear first and making sure everyone on the team understands that. Yeah, totally. Um, I'll never forget a number of years ago, I was working with a congregation and they had, you know, the typical long, you know, banquet table set up in their, their fellowship space and their building committee was there and a number of other leadership teams were there and they were trying to figure out what should, what should we build? You know, we need to do a, some type of building program because we're running out of space. And one end of the table was arguing for um, senior, you know, senior housing, the other end of the sp- the table was arguing for child care and, you know, like a daycare ministry. And they're arguing back and forth. And, and, and I was happened to be sitting in the middle of the, the table and I just kind of raised my hand waiting for the argument to stop. And I just kind of raised my hand and I asked them to tell me, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because, because if you can't tell me what you want to be, when you grow up, we have no right arguing about this because if there's if there's no vision, right? That's scriptural, right? Without vision, the people perish, right? Um, so you know we need that vision of what's on the horizon so that we know how to chart a course to it. Mm-hmm. I love that, and that's true of us personally as well. Like, say, if we have an internal struggle of, should I do this or that? Should I take this job or that job? Or which decision should I make? We need to step back and get that clear vision first. And then that helps filter through to make the decision a little easier and a little more strategic of what do we want and how can we get to that end goal? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of times I'll use with ministry organizations, that whole analysis of, okay, if I'm on my sailboat and I want to go to that green buoy on the horizon, um, I know that I have to head at a certain heading for that. The challenge might be is that the wind might be coming exactly from that same direction towards my boat. And that's the only place in in the world that a sailboat can't sail is right into the wind. So we have to take tacks. We have to tack zigzagging back and forth until we reach that destination. But as, as long as we know that, knowing that there's going to be some times where we have to tack or jibe to get to that destination, we can still keep our momentum going forward and keep our attitude where it has to be to reach that destination. That's encouraging to remember because whether it's personally or as an organization, we set out this plan and we expect it to be straightforward, but there's always going to be challenges and hurdles and unforeseen changes that we sure didn't see coming and expect, but knowing that and remembering that like, okay, just because we had a challenge doesn't mean that was the wrong decision, or it doesn't mean we can't change course if we need to, right. but we might need to adjust and shift with the wind as those things come up. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think, I think there's so much that um, we, we can encourage people in, right. Um, as, as, as ministry leaders that, like we were talking before about Rome not being built in a day. Um, So a couple of years ago, um, now put this in perspective, my wife and I just celebrated our fifth wedding anniversary. Um, When we met, I asked her one very important question after we had our spiritual connection down, knowing that we're believers and had that in line. 
um, I asked the question, do you sail? And if not, would you learn? And so she had never sailed before, but a um, couple of years into the, uh, our relationship, we sailed up to Port Washington, Wisconsin, about a th three and a half hour sail from Milwaukee. Um, it was a great day um, to sail up there. Great evening in Port Washington. We woke up to rain, heavier winds, heavier seas when we were supposed to sail back to Milwaukee. We left Port Washington, six foot waves, severe wind on the bow. And Mary said, I think we should go back. I think we should go back. I said, Mary, it's actually more dangerous if we try and sail back and dock and wait out things that way. I think we should sail on. And she asked me the question, how are we going to handle this? I said, we're going to take one wave at a time. We're going to sail that through that wave and we'll take on the next wave when it comes. Fast forward to um, 2020, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And, um, and we were talking about all the what ifs that could happen. And, you know, um, God be praised. She's doing great. Um, everything is in the back window or back mirror, rear view, rear view mirror, I guess, to see, to say. Um, but um, when, when she first was diagnosed, she asked the question, how are we going to handle this? And I said, same thing, same way we handled the trip back from Port Washington. We're going to take it one wave at a time. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of been her mantra now as she helps other people through challenging things in their life you know like you just mentioned COVID coming out of COVID you got to take things one wave at a time mm -hmm. we, we I think we shared over um, our first meeting um, my journey from St. Thomas to Bermuda last year um, with a very famous sailing author um, you know you set out on a journey like that and you know that the journey is going to be seven days, 10 days, whatever it might be. There are times where you say, man, you know, another day of open ocean and it doesn't seem like we're making progress yet. We are. And celebrating the, the little milestones of, okay, we, we made it through another day or another night, you know, the, 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 the old sailing, you know, I mean, back to the, the, the explorer's day, right? Um, the old saying was there are two best times in a sailor's day, sun up and sundown. It's when the sailor can celebrate, thank God we made it through another night at sea. And sundown, we made it through another day at sea. And, and just being able to celebrate that, um, those small victories, and say, okay, we're not at our final destination, but we're a little further. And having that mindset that, have we served all the people we've, we've wanted to, um, whether it's through a workshop or through um, getting the grant that we're seeking, um, or we receive the grant, have we, have we built it out as much as we want? Maybe not, but celebrate those small victories. So huge. Absolutely. Those baby steps add up over time more mm -hmm. than we realize, but it takes that small consistency to build the solid foundation for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, I'm glad you mentioned your long trip there because that was quite a journey from when we had talked about it. What were some lessons you learned from taking such a long trip? And give us just a little bit of background about how far it was and yeah, yeah. the story there. Yeah. So last year I sailed from St. Thomas to Bermuda, um, journey of about 950 miles when you consider all the taxes that we made. Uh, but um, it was a six and a half day journey over over the water. And um, 
you know, it, it was, as I tell people a lot, you know, it was not so much a test of sailing skills because I was sailing with some of the best sailors in the world. Um, or at least the captain obviously was one of the best sailors in the world. Uh, very prolific, prolific author, author uh, by the name of uh, John Kretschmar. And, um, but it, it wasn't so much a, a sailing skills test, but um, an emotional and, and mental fortitude test to say, again, like we just talked about, you know, wow, we've put on 150 miles yesterday or, you know, 80 miles yesterday. That's pretty cool and amazing. But holy crap, we still have 400 miles to go. I think I told you when we first met the, the story. We had sailed about 48 hours. And we all had a duty assignment, you know, for the just in case there was an emergency. You know, you know, Don had to go and get on the radio and call from for help. Mayday. Um, another Tim on board had to cut the life raft loose and and uh, another guy was supposed to cut the dinghy free and I had to go get the ditch bag. So everyone had one assignment, specific assignment for just in case something happens. We'd sailed about 48 hours from St. Thomas and John, the, the owner of the boat, asked the question over uh, captain's hour where we'd spend some downtime every day at five o'clock, just put the boat on autopilot, reflect on how things are going and what lessons we've learned so far. And John, at that point, asked the question, hey, do you all remember what your duty assignment is in case something happens? I said, yeah, John, why? He said, well, I, I just want to make sure you, you keep that forefront of your mind because right now, we're 350 miles north of St. Thomas. And our next closest piece of land is 600 miles away. And then he followed up with, so I want you to understand, if something happens, no one's coming anytime soon. And if we're going to survive, it's us working together and the help of the good Lord that's going to see us through. That was kind of um, one of those moments in your life where you say, oh, wow, well, what did I get myself into here? Um, puts it in perspective. Which I, which, which I knew going into it, right? But it puts things in perspective. And, and again, I think to answer your question, what are some things that um, I learned was the whole... Um, whole side of steward leadership that says, yeah, we've got to take care of each other, right? We've got to be caretakers of each other. You know, I teach stewardship with, with, and through Catalyst, right? Um, but, but really, truly being a caretaker of each other is huge. Mm -hmm. But, but what John was quick to point out was, you can't be a caretaker of somebody else unless you're taking care of yourself. So he had three simple rules on board. He said, first rule, and any skipper will tell you this, hey, your first rule on, on this boat is to stay on board the boat. Um, then his second line was the no I rule the no idiot rule no one does no one can treat anyone else on this boat like an idiot or be an idiot to anyone else he might have used a different letter but we're going to keep it clean. we'll keep it there yeah <laughs> yeah um and then third and it goes back to what we we're just talking about he said take care of yourself take care of yourself you know so it it sounds real peaceful and serene, and it can be taking this six-day voyage across the ocean. It can be serene. 
However, as John says, the, the sea is the one of the gra- last great wildernesses in the world. And so as such, the sea can get choppy and it can be really rough sleeping in a sailboat, especially when you're sailing 24 hours a day for that basically seven day period. So he's like, look, I'm going to give you a gold star if you take care of yourself and sleep when you can get it get a nap. I'm going to give you another gold star when you stay hydrated. And I'm going to give you another gold star if I see you taking care of your um, food needs and eating and staying, you know, nourished, um, so to speak. There's a whole process there. Um, Anyhow, um, and he said, listen, listen, why why is that so important? said if if you're not hydrated or you're lacking sleep or you're grumpy because your body's not functioning right because you're not feeding it correctly you might do something out of pure exhaustion that now puts you in danger of maybe going off the boat because of an accident or the whole crew off the boat. Or you might say something in haste because you're so exhausted. And and so you can't do that. So it taking care of each other starts with taking care of yourself first. And I think that's one of the biggest downfalls that nonprofit leaders and ministry leaders fall into they get into this super man or super woman persona and a lot of times i think because ministries are counting on donor dollars and they're maybe not um, staffed as well as they could or should be right because of lack of funds there's so much burnout and and um and poor productivity because they're not taking um, a deliberate pause out, whether that's on a weekly or a monthly or every quarter basis. Um, we talked earlier about the Hove 2 maneuver in sailing. So um, when, when a skipper is sailing along and he or she wants to just take time out for lunch or to do a repair, they can if they're sailing and not under power, they can actually start to turn the boat into the wind, stall out the foresail, and the boat basically holds a position, basically because it has the right tension on it. Not too much, not too little. And that boat stays in a hove to position. I think helping leaders understand that need to do that is really paramount in accomplishing the mission and vision of the, of the organization that, you know, um, if they're always pushing forward and not stepping back to say, yeah, how's this, how's this really going? You know, are we, are we communicating effectively with our, with our, um, constituents, uh, with our members, um, you know, are we really connecting with the people in our care? If they're not doing that, I think there's a, a there's a lack of effectiveness in organizations. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. that planned break or the planned pause is important because things are always going to be happening and always going to come up. And unless we deliberately say, okay, everybody, just take a minute and give ourselves that time and space to do that, a lot of times stuff just comes at us and we just keep putting out fires and that's how people burn out because it's never ending. But we have to deliberately pause this ship to be able to take that breath. Yeah, when you said that, it reminded me of uh, one of my my dear, dear friends who's a a pastor at uh, the church I go to. Every time he goes to... um, lead the odd uh, to lead the congregation in a prayer he'll he'll go to the altar 
and say, okay, we're going to pray, but then he'll ask the congregation, okay, take a moment, calm your heads, calm your hearts. And how many times do we go through a day in ministry without calming our heads and calming our hearts? Mm -hmm. And we really need both sides of that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, I keep thinking about, you said earlier how each person in case of emergency was designated one specific job. And at the time that might feel like, well, all I have to do is pick up the bag or, cut the rope or what that's all I have to do. But yet the whole team is relying on that one small thing. And if any piece of that breaks down, you might not survive. And so it's really important to keep that in perspective that sometimes we may feel like, well, my job's not as important or this one little thing can wait. It's not that big of a deal, but really it is because it all works together. And if each part is doing their job, in a healthy organization, then that helps contribute to the success of the whole. But we have to keep that perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're part of the team, and and every little piece matters. Um, that that story reminded me of another sailing story from uh, two years ago, where. Um, I was actually on Lake Michigan, um, so some would consider that well. That's just a little inland lake. Actually, no, it's an inland sea. <laughs> it's ask, pretty huge. Ask, ask Ted Turner, who, after winning America's Cup, was asked to sail on the Chicago Mack race and asked why in the world he would want to sail on a little mill pond. He ran into a storm on that, and he said, after the race, I'll never say that Lake Michigan or any of the Great Lakes are mill ponds any, anymore. Mm -hmm. But as, I, was on a, I was on a race in 2020, up Lake Michigan, um, over to Menominee, Michigan. It's a 189 nautical mile race. So again, you're sailing around the clock on that one as well. Um, around midnight, um, day one of the race, um, when I went off of watch, um, the National Weather Service was calling for 70 mile an hour winds, torrential rain, thunder and lightning, and just for, just for extra giggles, some potential hail Ooh. and um and i went off of watch um after not sleeping for about 18 and a half hours and I tried to get some shut eye um found out that that was next to impossible because uh did get very very violent we didn't quite see the 70 mile an hour winds we saw 55 mile an hour winds um, 12 boats got demasted in that storm, so their masts were torn apart. Um, another seven boats had their sails ripped to shreds. Um, but as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of tension on that that boat. Um, it was like it, it was kind of like a calm tension because we knew we couldn't let the tension get to each of us so that it would affect the whole crew. But we had some, some instances where we had a, a helmsman who kind of thought he knew it all and could be the real leader, even though he lacked some experience and, and we had to coach him through, you know, some shared language issues because he would talk about, you know, letting a sail out and or doing a specific activity he wasn't using the correct language and so some errors were being made and 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 then we have to compensate for those errors and finally we had to say look we we can't read each other's mind we have to communicate clearly and stay calm if we're going to survive the storm and and after that little momentary pause during that very very tense situation we made it through and we really gelled as as a as a very young crew we a bunch of us had raced on different boats and this other boat owner said hey i'll, I'll race this boat uh, if you guys want to join me so 
yeah, we came together. But it wasn't until we took that little stand down, even in a very tense situation, to say, okay, let's think through how we're communicating and determine what our shared language is. It goes back to vision, right? What we talked about early on. Unless we know what the shared language is, whether that's what does success look like or what are we calling X, Y, and Z in this ministry, we're not going to be successful at accomplishing the, the, the goal and objective without that. Right. And that's one of those situations where it could have gone either way. And you had a lot at stake. I mean, that was a very dangerous situation that had to be calmed down. Yeah, yeah. What would you say to a nonprofit? Where should they start if they are struggling to navigate some of these dynamics, tensions, confusion? What are like just a couple of basic questions or steps they could take just to start untangling? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, visual picture there untangling. I Again, no pun intended, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, no, because sometimes, sometimes lines do get twisted, right? And you have to, again, take that momentary pause to really examine, okay, where is this twisted and why? And I think for, for ministries, it goes back to, okay, why do, why do we exist? Why, why did, did God put us in this ministry and who are we being called to serve? I think that's, that's the biggest question. And then, then what are we good at? You know, um, there's a lot of different jobs on a race boat. Okay. One of them is the bow, bowman, bow person, right? And the bowman on a race boat watches traffic and and sits right at the the bow of the boat bouncing around in the open seas and and watches the trim of the jib and the trim of the sails from a very unique perspective and that's a that's a very important job is it a job for everybody no not everyone wants to be like that close to the water at you know and that much in the open and not everybody would be that committed and diligent to pay attention bingo bingo you have to really be focused exactly yeah we've run into some uh situations where a bowman wasn't very present mentally present one a couple of times and and avoided had to take some aversive action to avoid some collisions um but um but you know, just because it's like this really amazing, glamorous, and you know, daring position doesn't mean it's the most important job on a race boat. That person that is actually just sitting on the side of the boat, keeping the boat balanced, has just an important role, right? So, you know, just kind of saying, what what are our strengths? What, what's our individual strengths that we are working out, working from, and how can we partner up with another? person within the organization to really be the most effective in the purpose of the the organization and and in in God's kingdom as well mm-hmm. um, I think that's 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 huge um, yeah you know um, it was just with the nonprofit uh, church two weeks ago and they were talking about back to your kind of your your analogy about the lines right? Um, they're talking about how oftentimes people will come up with great ideas and will start going down a path or two to get progress, we think, towards a goal in the ministry, yet it kind of slips out of our hand. And, and I said, you know, um, that's why sailors always tie stopper knots in the end of their lines on a boat. If you ever heard of the saying, hold on to the bitter end, 
it comes from sailing. That stopper knot is called the bitter end oh. on, a, on a rope. We don't have ropes on a sailboat. We have sheets, lines, or halyards, you know, depending on what they're used. It's how, what they're called, right? But holding on to the bitter end, right? So we need things within our organization. We need those, those, those checkpoints that, that, that so, to call, so to speak, a stopper knot to grab onto to say, okay, are we making progress? Are we, are we, are we, are we, are we on the right course here? Um, and is everything set up right so that we can make the progress, whether it's getting the grant, executing on a grant, or serving more people that we're called to serve. Even just having those clearly defined milestones and goals that we know everyone's working towards these checkpoints. And if we're veering off course, we need to reevaluate and see how can we get back on course? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that is is spot on. So I I teach coastal cruising uh, for American Sailing Association and um, we've done some, some journeys with people, some classes where we say, all right, we're going to chart out this trip um, on paper before we leave the dock. Well, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do this? Well, sometimes systems fail. So I was doing a, a trip from Charlevoix, Michigan, down to Racine, um, a couple of years ago, it was the first week of May. The water temperature of Lake Michigan was 41 degrees. The transducer um, froze up and the chart plotter would go out occasionally in the cold water. Mm. Well, if that chart plotter goes out and is out for the rest of the journey, and if we don't know what our heading should be because we didn't plot it on, our, on paper, Mm-hmm. If that's, that's all so, you had, so good, yeah. So the importance of setting up those milestones, huge, mm-hmm. and knowing everyone on the team understanding where you're headed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. A lot of good analogies there. <laughs> we could keep comparing all day because it just brings up more and more connections and ideas that you could compare it to within teams and within organizations, even just, you know, if you're getting off course only a tiny bit, but you keep going, eventually you're going to end up way off where you wanted to be. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, whether it's, you know, sailing down uh, from upper east side of Lake Michigan down to the lower southwest portion of lake michigan um we always teach people hey log log um every three hours what your position is Mm -hmm. and if something goes wrong with the the gps and and chart plotter at least we can recreate and figure out if we're on course for, for the right destination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think in a nonprofit too, I've seen where it can be so valuable to track your progress. Like you were saying earlier of appreciating and understanding how far we've come as opposed to just saying, Oh, we wanted to be there and we still haven't raised those funds or we still haven't reached those goals, but let's look at how far you've come since you started and measure those gains and those milestones that you have done and celebrate those, even the baby steps. And that helps generate more momentum and more enthusiasm among the team. Yeah. Yeah. Early on in my, um, in in consulting with nonprofits, I was working for an organization that had um, pulled in a a fairly well-noted speaker at the time. Um, uh, she was the wife of uh, then Attorney General, and this this lady was an amazing speaker on rights for people with disabilities, known all over the country. We we're going to have her in this workshop in Frederick, Maryland, and 
I don't know what the challenge was with the promotion at that time, but we had a handful of people and I was hoping for, you know, a couple hundred people. Um, you know, we had probably 20 people signed up for this workshop. I was hoping for 150 people. And I, and I'll never forget apologizing to her and I, and saying, Ginny, I'm really sorry that your audience is so small and, um, and that um, more people aren't going to hear your message. She just looked at me and she said, Tim, Jesus said, feed my lambs. He didn't say anything about counting them, but feed them. And, and I think it's a lesson that kind of stuck with me, uh, you know, to, to always really pour into the, the ones that are there mm -hmm. and give them the very best, even though it's, it's maybe not the numbers you would hope for. Mm -hmm. And, and I think I've seen enough nonprofits that they, like you said, they kind of throw up their hands. Well, you know, we only had, no, I had 10 people at this workshop. Why, why even try it again? We're not going to ever get over 10, but they keep at it and they see success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that just underlines the importance of being faithful in the small things and the little things, because that's how we grow. That's how we improve. That's how we learn. And then we'll grow and be trusted with bigger things and mm -hmm. keep going. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, as we wrap up, share a resource that has been meaningful to you in your journey. Yeah, I think one of my favorite books is a book by Bob Chapman, Everybody Matters. Um, uh, yeah, everyone, Everybody Matters. Um, but Chapman in this book talks about how everyone in an organization truly does matter. Simon Sinek tells the story from Chapman's book. And in fact, they're going to be on a podcast. I forget where, um, uh, maybe through one of the bigger magazines together soon where um, Chapman was, was um, faced with having to cut his workforce and wasn't sure how to do it so he could keep his management team intact and and yet not impact production too much and he's trying to try to figure out you know how he could take care of the bigger people instead of the quote unquote the little people within the organization and the story goes and Sinek tells the same story of retells Chapman's story but but the story goes is that Bob Chapman was at this wedding one weekend when he was kind of in the midst of trying to decide what to do and he got to the point in the wedding where the pastor asked who gives this woman to this man and the dad stood up with the mom and the dad said her mother and I and Chapman said he had an epiphany at that that time where where he realized that his employees in quotes were not his employees, but they were somebody else's son or daughter, mom or dad, brother or sister. And, and how he treats those people in his organization and how they're going to treat everyone else in their life. And so he figured he had to do something that was going to impact everyone, whether high position or low position, but everyone was going to make some kind of con contribution mm -hmm. sacrifice in order to make the company better. And it paid off big dividends for him because he realized that everyone really does count and that we really do have to be connected to and present with the people that we work with in our organizations. So I think that's, um, that's one great resource. The other one, is um, as a, as a book by uh, Kethridge and Irwin called uh, Lead Yourself First. It's a great book. It talks about how 
some of the greatest leaders in time, and and Irwin, one of the co-authors of that book, uh, used to teach at West Point. And so he talked about a lot of times military examples, but some of the greatest generals in the world actually had to take time and solitude to get their act together before they could do some major things in battle. And hopefully that dog barking isn't going to distract you. <laughs> we my like ten- dogs around here. Yeah. That's okay. My, my tenant's dog. Um, so anyhow, lead yourself first. I think that's so very important. It goes back to what I learned last summer on the sailboat, right? That you can't help others until you help yourself. Mm-hmm. So put, put the, uh, put the mask on, on yourself first on the airplane before you try and help somebody else. Mm-hmm. Take care of everyone, including yourself. Yeah. Not neglect yourself. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Those are good reminders. I've heard of lead yourself first, but I haven't read that one yet. So I will add both of those to my list and I'll link them in the show notes in case people want to look them up. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, tell us how people can find you online if they want to connect and learn more. And if you want to share a little bit about specifically what you do and some of your sailing programs, they're so cool yeah. and unique. Yeah. Yeah. So for um, nonprofit assistant, um, you can connect to, to me at, uh, at uh, catalystbuilds.com and uh, email there is tditloff at catalystbuilds.com and can certainly help um, nonprofits through that. And uh, if you have a leadership role in a, in a for-profit company, um, just go to fullsaleleadership.com or Tim at fullsaleleadership.com. And I'd be happy to, you know, offer some, uh, for nonprofits, uh, a free half hour assessment of how you're doing as an organization to see if you're on track to accomplish those goals and objectives. I really like this unique approach to leadership and how you've taken something like sailing to be able to teach and lead and train people in this unusual but very meaningful and memorable way so thank you for sharing with us thanks thanks i appreciate the opportunity all right friends what did you think what was your biggest takeaway i don't know about you but his analogy with the big waves and when they were sailing and his wife is starting to get scared and he said we're just going to take it one wave at a time and keep going through that really helped me because i know sometimes we hit big projects or big roadblocks or hurdles that feel so big and we just have to take it one wave at a time sometimes we just need to break it down and take the next right step So I hope this was encouraging to you. I would love to hear your takeaways. Come connect with me on LinkedIn, join me in our private LinkedIn community, or shoot me a message on my website and let's keep the conversation going. Remember, go listen to my TEDx talk, share it with a friend, and let's support nonprofits as much as we possibly can. We need you out there doing good work. So have a great week and go change your world.